All right, we've got Chris Brown uh, coming to us from Seattle, uh, director of Complex PCI uh, with the Complex case. Chris, take it away. Oh, hey, Hayden. Thanks for uh, having me, man. So I got a case here, uh, octogenarian lady um, presented to uh, one of our outside system hospitals, um, had some coronary shot, uh, had elevated lactate, got a balloon pump and uh, was sent over here to have a heart team approach, talk about cabbage, PCI, opted for PCI, lactate improved some on the balloon, um, but you know has pretty severe coronary disease here. And so we opted to do this as a protected case. Has pretty severe calcification too. You can see that you can pretty much find her coronaries before we even start any work. And has some pretty severe angulation and some, you know, some post aneurysmal stuff uh, where you find those really calcified, hard to hard to modify nodules, in my opinion. Um, yeah. You know, pretty bad disease. Uh, we went ahead and tried to do some NC stuff, but you can see here in the middle of this NC balloon, we after we got to eighteen or twenty atmospheres on this balloon, we knew we were getting almost nowhere without some lithotripsy. Went ahead and did some lithotripsy, uh, then post dilated, got some good results there. Uh, has this really retroflex circumflex. It was hard to wire uh, from a technical standpoint at first. Uh, ended up having to put a big bend on the wire, get it to flop in there, and then with a microcatheter back the wire up and then be able to you know turn it over so it could go. Almost had to reverse wire this actually, which would have been very unfavorable given the distal left main disease and all that calcium. Um, was able to do some balloon angioplasty. You can see after ballooning, we got pretty good flow now. Uh, and we've modified a lot of this plaque and to some degree have, you know, a little rent in the vessel near that circumflex. I'm so pretty hey, happy with me, that. Let me back you up there on these retro, yep. retroflex circumflex. Go back one. What are your, what are your thoughts? What's your process? Maximizing support. For me, it's probably a guideliner up front, right? Do you swap for wiggle? Like any other tips you have for these? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's two, there's three questions you have to ask yourself. You can already see the little rent that even this non wiggle wire made. So you have to be real careful because you can get a pretty contained medial dissection when you use a really stiff wire in this retroflexion. And so when you mm -hmm. can't deliver, certainly that's one of, one of the good options. I think the other option is what you mentioned, which is to use a balloon assisted tracking or to take a balloon and pull a guide extension. in. I prefer to use a six wrench guidezilla um, or, or a smaller guide extension. And I actually use it in a seven French guide next to my LED wire. So I don't put the LED wire inside of it. That allows you to track it into right. the circumflex without getting stopped at the bifurcation. You still get to protect the LED and the left main, and you can deliver your equipment or your stent that way. And that's sort of my general, um, the general way that I do that. So interaction is not a big deal with a six French uh, guidezilla and a uh, separate wire outside of it. Um, no, not the seven French guide. Guidezilla versus Guideliner? Uh, Guidezilla because it's hydrophilically coated right now. Uh, if yeah. Guideliner comes out with hydrophilic coating, then it'll be right. you know just as good if you want to call it that. But really, the coating makes a huge difference in its deliverability. Uh, that's really sort of the, the deal breaker there. Yeah, I've learned that from you. And uh, yeah, that's been a big yeah. help. So yeah, when you finish up. So, you know, then you got to choose a strategy here. So we're going to secure the mid LED first and then work on our bifurcation strategy that has a big, you know, dissection. And we want to make sure that there's good flow down this while we're doing the other work. Uh, even though we're protected, we still want to be able to do it. This is us bringing a bigger shockwave balloon in, just shockwave in this left main bifurcation, making sure we really modify this the best we can. Um, go to my next photo here. And so we went ahead with uh, balloon assisted tracking. You can see our guide extension inside of our guide there. We've already unsheathed it. We don't want to keep this person ischemic if we can avoid it. And we're trying to make sure we get the right deployment strategy here. So we had to go in with a bigger stent because we were a little short. Our, when you have this kind of retroflexion, your IVUS pullback length can be incorrect. Uh, and we use a lot of pullback measurements to try and get make sure we don't have to open extra stents when we don't need to. Um, but in this case, it shorted us a couple, two, two and a half, three millimeters. And so we had to switch to a slightly longer stent, uh, re-delivered it with the guide extension, balloon assisted, of course. And we're just trying to figure out how can we land this with the least amount of double metal uh, in the left main, but still make sure we actually cover that retroflex portion of the circumflex. And so we were able to do that um, pretty successfully. And then we come back in here for our crush and we're going to go ahead and crush this out. And we're going to, you know, we're going to optimize and we're going to recross and then we're going to kiss and we're going to repot and we're probably post, you know, we're going to post dilate our distal stuff. Uh, and then this left main is long and has an osteo lesion. Mm. Um, so the way that we had done the LAD 
uh, back to left main was with sort of the, the longest Megatron. And then we're putting in another one, just trying to get this osteum. And we're in a pretty cranial view here. Generally speaking, LAO cranial is the view to deploy left main stent. But really what you're looking for is for this cusp to be completely outlined with contrast. And you can yeah. clearly see where you need to place your stent. You're not worried about the roof. You're only, you know, you're worried about the bottom because that's really where the, the coronary ends. So we're obviously going to move our stent a bunch here, trying to find the perfect place. And then to go ahead and deploy Beautiful. it. Yep. Put a big boy in, and then we're going to take some final shots. And we like these images quite a bit. Um, you know, we've got small vessels that are going to grow. We had to do a little light balloon angioplasty distally, maybe a little dissection, but no flow limitation. Just trying to make sure we have outflow so our stents don't end up with a problem later. You know, you got a lot of pinched small diagonals, but these are sub one millimeter vessels. So we're just happy we have excellent Timmy 3 flow and that she can kind of recover and do better. That's great. So you're going to Megatron for your left main stents? Yeah, I, I pretty much use Megatron for almost all the left mains now, just because the, the size profile is great. You can go from a 3.5 or a 3.75 LAD into a 5.5 left main, and you don't have to worry about having a stent matrix that's all sorts of upside down. Um, and, you know, we got great coverage of the osteum there, that circumflex, and we're really happy with the, the technical result there. And so then we'll, we take completion angiograms of all of our supported cases now, put a four French sheath back in, four French pigtail after we've tightened the per close, and just prove that we haven't caused any trauma to the vasculature and that our closure looks like it's going to be good. And then you can take that stuff out and just close your per close down over the, the wire or whatever you're going to do and be done. Oh, that's good. So take it out, per close down onto a little dilator, and then take a final shot. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep. I, I like that. Then you walk out of the lab, you don't have any worries. You don't have any worries at all. And when somebody calls you for X, Y, or Z, you know that there's nothing wrong because you proved that there was nothing wrong before you left. Yeah. Yeah. I like to put that extra time in myself too. Um, definitely on towers and stuff, take a final shot because yep. you leave, you don't have to worry about coming back in and, you know, uh, great case. Uh, last question for you. The, what would you call that? Did you think about provisional left main in the LED or you'd wanted to? Well, you know, once we were able to eye this with all those aneurysms, it made it very difficult to appreciate or see what was exactly going on. But it turned out there was actually a distal left main lesion that we couldn't, that was kind of almost hidden because of the way those aneurysms started. And mm -hmm. then there was pretty bad disease just at the retroflexion of the circ. And so we felt sort of committed to a two stent strategy that included the bifurcation just to make sure that we didn't have a problem later. Because I think the, the hardest part is in five years or whatever it might be, if there was a problem just at the ostium of the circumflex, because if we left that alone, we had left just the ostium alone. I don't know how I would have gotten back in there from a technical standpoint, and maybe it would have been easy or whatever, but it sure didn't look like it when we wired it up front this time. So we went ahead and covered it. And I, I think that's going to give her, you know, sort of the best outcome. And again, the, she's an octogenarian. We got excellent flow. Her lactate normalized. We were able to come off of the impello. No support needed. It was on like two Oliva fed, went upstairs and that was weaned off. So, you know, all things considered, you know, Shockwave bought us the opportunity to not have to use a rotaburr and somebody who's relatively small with small-ish arteries, although pretty big once you actually got to the media and put the stents in, Yep. Um, but who's pretty sick and we wanted to be able to work sort of quickly. And, you know, we manage our shocks in these patients. We use five shocks at a time instead of 10 just to manage the ischemia when we need to. Huh. Um, because I don't love it even when the impel is in, when we start to lose pulsatility, I try and minimize that the best I can. Cause there's hemodynamic effects to that. So, so if they're getting sick, you'll just do five pulses. Yeah. If they look like they're going to get sick, even if the impel is going to support them. I mean, she was small enough that a CP is all of her cardiac output pretty much anyway. Right. Um, right. But I still don't want it to, to, I, I would like to keep their hemodynamics as stable as possible. And then these aneurysms, it seems like. For me, I mean, I'm sure I doubt there's any data, but you know, IVL versus rota aneurysmal segments, I mean, it makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. Do the least. I mean, it, it does. And it makes more sense too, because if there's any calcification moving into the aneurysmal segment, you know, the rota, it, it's a path maker, in my opinion. And that's sort of how I use rota now is to make a path so I can do with the tripsy, because I need to modify the deep calcium, not just the superficial stuff. And I also need to modify calcium that's bigger than my rota burr sometimes, or sure. a lot of the time. So, it, it really, it's the big difference maker here, I think, for sure. Perfect. All right, Grace. Great to have you on. Thanks a lot. Thanks, man.